I say any project that offers the you opportunity to buy a new tool or two is a good thing to do. <laughs> I would much rather buy <laughs> I would buy a table saw and a miter saw way before I ever bought a paint sprayer. Mid just any, me. Any project that can be used as a Trojan horse for tool purchase. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Editorial Director Andrew Zellner. Hey, Patrick. Production Manager for TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwant. Morning. And our producer, Jeff Rose. Hi there. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. It is great to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. So uh, I'm going to start off today. I got a chance to go see Brian Pontalillo's new build, and I was helping uh, him and his brother-in-law, Philip, and excuse me, his brother-in-law, Jack, and his friend, Philip, uh, sheath the roof on his new build. So he is progressing quite well. Good for him. Have you guys been staying in touch at all about his uh, progress? A little bit. He's he's batted a few questions and ideas off of me. And I, I think Kylie actually was the one that sent me a rendering of it, uh, which was pretty cool to see. Well, it's a beautiful uh, spot where he's building and the home is progressing nicely. He's he's doing a very tidy job is how I would describe it. It, it looks exactly like it's supposed to. No weirdness. Nice. Is he and, doing any content uh, about it for the magazine or for the website? I believe he's going to talk about using some liquid flashing to, uh, you know, prepare yeah, his we, window openings. We, we've um, got a, a flashing video on the schedule and ho hopefully some more stuff <laughs> um, coming up. His build is interesting. It's like yours, Ian. It's more complicated than it needs to be, but it is an attractive <laughs> little house, I got to say. Come on. What's, what's the use of doing the project if you're not going to make it complicated? <laughs> So he's got two monoslope roofs with like a little clear story, you know, separating the two uh, respective planes. And I'm just thinking about like painting that every few years and flashing <laughs> it to integrate into the roof. You know, it's, it's amazing. I love it very much. All the snow that's going to pile up in front of it <laughs> in the middle of the Connecticut winter. <laughs> He was really ready. To his credit, I think you guys would agree there's two kinds of builders, uh, owner builders maybe is the best way to describe it. You know, folks who tell you that you're going to do something uh, this day and they're either ready to do that thing or they're uh, about halfway to getting there. And sometimes it's very theoretical uh, if they're ready or not. He was truly ready to sheathe the roof, like he said. So that was cool. I, I feel like I encompassed all of those stages of readiness at different <laughs> times throughout my project when I had people come and help me. Has, do you know, has he been running into any supply chain stuff? You know, it's funny, Samantha asked me this uh, very same question this morning, and he's been stockpiling stuff, I'm pretty sure, since before the site was even excavated for his foundation. So I'm... It seems like he didn't want to take any chances with availability of stuff, so he just started putting it on the building lot, which, you know, in the places I used to build, build uh, it wouldn't be there uh, <laughs> the subsequently. So, you know, he can get away with that in rural Connecticut, but I'm sure there's places you can't do that. He made the move pretty quick once he realized that he wasn't going to be able to buy what he, what he wanted to buy, where they were living. Uh, they were... South Carolina, right? When he was yes. looking for houses to buy. And then I think he was trying, he was looking here and then decided that, you know, he could build something at least as affordably as what was on the market. Yeah, but I remember him getting his trusses really early. Like they were on site before the hole was dug, which, you know, folks would tell you that's a poor use of resources. But if you're paying it all for yourself anyway, uh, does it really matter? And you're guaranteed to have them when you need them, more importantly. He's doing a, an interesting thing where uh, it's a single-story house with a, a, a live-in basement like you have, Ian. And uh, this, the, the roof system is trussed, but on top of the um, 
wall plates on the first floor, he has ceiling joists, which are a mechanical uh, chase, if you will, a mechanical space service cavity. And uh, on top of that, he put a layer of uh, half-inch sheathing and then put the trusses on top of that. And the half-inch sheathing is going to be his air barrier. It is his air barrier. And he's going to put tons of uh, cellulose insulation on top of that. And it'll be largely uninterrupted because the bottom cord of the truss is only two by four. So um, it seems like a good strategy. I was looking at all the expense of the ceiling joists and the, and the additional layer of sheathing and thinking to myself, you could almost have built a second story on this house for a little more money. So I'd be curious to see, uh, if his energy bills, uh, you know, make that a worthwhile pursuit. What do you guys think? I mean, I think it's probably easier to set trusses when you've got a solid platform to stand on, you know, and that was and one as, of the reasons he gave me for doing this, Andrea, very, very true. And as like an owner builder, you know, you may not have all, you know, machinery you need or like a skeleton crew or people who haven't necessarily done it before. So like that, I think that safety is a, a part of it that he's. Even for putting the sheathing on the roof, I can tell you it was very nice to have that surface to walk around on. Uh, it's mm -hmm. Eve, you know, at a point you couldn't reach it anymore because of the roof slope, but yeah, setting the first row of sheathing uh, was <laughs> way safer because yeah. of that thing to walk on that pl flat layer to walk on. I've seen that done on a couple different projects. I know the one of uh, Ben Bogey and Dan Colbers that I visited, they sheathed the ceiling in, I think it was just regular commodity grade OSB that they used and taped the seams. One unforeseen consequence of doing this is we had a huge downpour. Uh, I think it was the day before we went to sheathe the roof and, uh, of course, this thing holds water like a swimming pool because <laughs> it's meant to keep out air. And uh, he had to drill a number of holes in that layer to let the water out so, you know, there wasn't inches of water we were walking through. So if you decide to do this, keep that in mind. You may have to uh, relieve the water pressure that's built up <laughs> on top of it. So you all done with your place now, Ian? No. Um <laughs> So I was, uh, I was actually at a, a wedding over the weekend, and it was the oldest son of the guy I apprenticed under when I was in the carpenters union. So I, I'm old enough now to like have <laughs> people that I remember as like five years Children, old on yes. job sites <laughs> that are getting married. Um, but so they're they're all carpenters, and I was trying to explain the theory of done enough because they they. <laughs> They couldn't understand it, and probably because they're union commercial guys, they're they're not really tuned in as much to, to home building. But they were like, "Your house is done, right? You're living there." It's like, yeah, "Well, we're living there, but it's not done. It'll probably never be done." And they're like, "Well, are you waiting on material?" Like, "No, it's just I'm waiting on time to do it and the desire to do it." And uh, when I told them about my stairwell, uh, the Andy Engel Memorial stairwell with uh, the plywood baluster. Uh, they, they were just like, well, why would you do that in the first place? Because like, I didn't have the time. Plywood, it's there in the garage, nail it up. Their context uh, is totally different because there's enough so, money to finish their job and time, right, yeah. and, you know, and that's, and then it is done, right? Yeah, finally they were just like, so it's it's like the cobbler whose children have no shoes. I was like, exactly. It's it's just like that. Uh, I would say they have cheap shoes or cheap shoes, uh, yeah, <laughs> or damaged <laughs> shoes or whatever. Uh, no, we we got a big project done with our our fancy dog run, uh, fenced in a nice little area around our side deck and put landscaping stones down for the dogs to go out and run around in and did a pretty nice job with just some pressure treated lumber to, to make a fence for them. And uh, we planted a bunch of plantings around it. Uh, I had no idea that Sarah had stockpiled like 15 bushes at my parents' house last year and just <laughs> oh, that was planted smart. them yeah. in the ground with the assumption we'd be pulling them up. And I you know, was thinking we were done on Monday afternoon, and she's like, I got 20 plants to put around here. It's like, where? <laughs> so, no, it looks, it looks nice. It's, uh, at every place we've lived, it's just always been like snow fence or just some rickety makeshift dog run area. So it's 
it's pretty cool to have a, a nicely built one that matches the house. You used uh, ag panels, right? Per, uh, as the as the uh, <laughs> right. I used wire fencing. <laughs> I used a roll of like hog fencing for it. Yeah, yeah it looks great. Stapled it to the. Uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty happy with it. So, did you use old school fence staples like you'd nail to a split rail fence? I found driving those to be a, an interesting experience. No, I hate doing that. Uh, so I went and got <laughs> galvanized staples for one of the uh, staple guns that we've got sitting around. And uh, you had to really do it with intent to make sure that you uh, hit the staple on the wire. The wire was much thicker gauge than I remembered it being when I found the roll a couple months ago and, and thought of this for a, a use for it. Well, what's, uh, what's coming up? Have you decided what's next? I got to finish the garage. I had to finish insulating and drywalling it. That was supposed to be my fall project, but then I got COVID and never got the steam back up to work on it again in February when I was starting to feel better. So I think that'll be a fun project because the, uh, you know, uh, quality of life improvement will be huge. Yeah. Yeah, there's just enough room to park our vehicles in there and then pull the vehicles out and set up the shop tools. But uh, getting the drywall lift and all the drywall that's in there and the insulation in the walls where it's going to stay will be uh, be a lot of a lot of new room in the garage. And Jeff, you you went to a wedding this weekend also. Yes. Yeah, my niece got married. Well, what's the important part about this, Jeff? You're forgetting to tell everyone. Yeah, well, I, I was the uh, officiant, so. <laughs> I think that's awesome. The photo we saw was great. Well, good for you and good for them. Congratulations. Andrew, what have you been up to? Uh, really just knocking some stuff off the, the list. Um, we're, we're having fiber internet installed to our house, and so where the internet comes into our house is at like the exact opposite corner where it is now. So I've uh, had to upgrade our modem and uh, tr trying to decide if I want to try to run some hardwire ethernet up to the second floor or yes. um, if I can do an extender. Um, <laughs> Put the cable in, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's. Yeah. You, you yeah, won't no, regret it, it. Yeah. You won't regret it. Yeah. Um, and, and then uh, like, everyone you know i've i've had a kitchen fully functional now for almost three years and i've still got some uh molding to to put up so i ran a few test pieces i'm, I'm just cutting some cove in some some cherry um and i actually was recommended i so i've been doing it on my table saw with like an auxiliary fence and i had been doing it with just like a regular 10 inch blade and somebody suggested you should use your dado stack because it's uh, firmer and we'll cut it like a flat bottom better and it it works much better than than a uh just a regular 10 inch blade so how do you have to change the relation of the stock to the blade to account for the smaller diameter of the dado set um you have to <laughs> you have to pivot on the the table i mean it really it's just like Try and see what it looks like, and if that's good enough, that's about as. Is it as more far perpendicular or less perpendicular to the blade with the dado set? With the dado set, it is less perpendicular. More to the blade. skewed. Yeah. Interesting. I have never done this. It looks absolutely terrifying to me. I, so I thought it was going to be terrifying. <laughs> it's not. And like you're also you're just removing the slightest bit of material each pass. Like I'm not trying to get to that full, you know, half half inch depth in one go. It's, you know, five passes. Do you have to pass your hands over the blade? That is the thing that always just completely freaks me out. You do, but you just use push blocks, you know, it's you know, just be smart about it. It's You're nodding your head, Ian. Have you done this? Oh, plenty of times. You can do some pretty cool stuff with it, especially when you start uh, skewing the blade on an angle. You can start <laughs> to do oblique and, and different shaped uh, curves. But we also, we were doing it on a seven and a half or 16 inch Invicta 
table <laughs> saw when we were doing it at mine and Alan's shop, which that was. So how, what is the feet per second that'll fling a piece of stock, that machine? <laughs> so that, that one, I had, uh, I had it across the like 20 plus foot shop uh, and I did throw a board through the door, uh, through the glass door at the end of the shop one time. And people it, ask it why I'm scared like of this. A, yeah. Like a gun. Yeah, that was a scary saw. Have you done but this, yeah, Jeff? Do some cool stuff. No, I haven't, no. Yeah. Does it scare you? I mean, does it seem like a reasonable thing to do to you? It, it, I would have to really think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, have you ever seen the uh, video of, I think it's Mario Rodriguez doing the, uh, the Windsor seat scoop? on the, the table saw, kind of the same sort of operation. <laughs> yeah, that that's actually a, a popular woodworking video. Um, and it, it, the, like the setup for it and like how repeatable it is once you build the jig, it was just like mind blowing. Um, but it, and like the order of operations, it's like once you dial it in, you could cut I don't know, a dozen chair seats an hour or something. It was pretty incredible. Yeah, when you first see it, though, it's like the cove molding thing where yeah, people Yeah, you're like, there's like, no way wait, anyone wait. does this ever. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah. You can imagine if the Windsor chair makers would have had access to a table <laughs> saw, they would have not been using a scoop to make right. the bottom of their nope. seats, right? Yeah. There's no way. Boy, we well, really got off into a, a different Taunton product there. I think we're <laughs> muscling in on their action if they listen to this podcast. I don't think anyone who listens to this podcast is going to <laughs> contemplate making a Windsor chair seat on a table saw. I'm just <laughs> guessing, though. I don't know. I don't know. I think you'd be surprised about some of our listeners. Oh, please let me know, folks, if you or me. I want to hear. I do. I bet Barbara's made a Windsor chair before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, boy, we heard from a couple folks on uh, heat pump water heaters uh, based on my query in uh, 461. Hey, podcast crew, in response to your request for water heating feedback in episode 461, I want to report that I'm very happy with my Ream 80-gallon heat pump water heater that I installed three years ago for my family of seven. In heat pump only mode, it keeps up fine with our demand better than 95% of the time. It also provides some nice dehumidification to my generally humid basement. I smile to myself every time I walk by and see the yellow energy guide sticker that says the estimated yearly energy cost is $161, which is far below the cost range of similar models. Unfortunately, I cannot say precisely what it saves me in electrical use, but I'd like to think it is significant. Up front, it cost about a third more than a conventional electric resistance heater, but at the time, my utility offered a $500 rebate on the purchase. I would highly recommend a heat pump water heater to anyone who is interested. I'll save my building science questions for another day. As always, thanks for all your wit and wisdom. John. Well, thanks, John. That's very good. I should tell you all, you, you probably know I bought a resistance heater just because I was scared of the uh, logistics of the heat pump water heater and dealing with condensate and... You know, my cheapness was the other significant concern. <laughs> I, I did a little bit more reading about heat pump uh, water heaters. Um, I want to say Allison Bales uh, had had an article on GBA, uh, like a one year update article. Um, and one of the things I didn't think about was like the size of the water tank and the you would think you like you want to size it to the number of people in your house. But like with the heat pump. The thought is you want the most water because keeping that water warm with a heat pump is cheaper than bringing new water up to town. And they so, recover slowly, uh, yeah. you know, so you need more water for a draw. Yeah. And consequently, they're bigger, right? You know, right. instead of 40 gallons like my water heater, he's got an 80, which I think is the starting point. I don't think they come much smaller than that. Yeah, so I've, I've, I'm, I may be on the, the heat pump water heater train now. All right. Now that I got excited about it. <laughs> we have more on that in a little bit here. Uh, this comes from Paul Barraza. 
Patrick, it was great to hear a question from Anu, a fellow East Bay resident on episode 461. Most of the termites in this area are the subterranean type, and in my 15 plus years of doing home inspections, I've never seen mud tubes on the exterior of a building. Their preferred path is on the inside of the foundation, so I wouldn't be particularly worried about termites getting into exterior foam. Borate, tr borate treatments are good for interior applications like a mud sill, but since borates are water soluble, it won't last long term in an exterior application. If Anu is still concerned about termites, I'd suggest a structural pest operator to do a perimeter or treatment. Please feel free to share my contact information with Anu, especially if he has more questions about home hardening. And thanks again for the great podcast. P.S. Hopefully you'll remember me from my appearance on Pro Talk 383. You didn't remember my name in a subsequent podcast, so I guess I won't be running for office on name recognition anytime soon. It comes to the territory when you have a hard to pronounce last name. Paul, uh, my anomia uh, is a disability. Uh, please don't take offense. I apologize. I don't remember anyone's name often. So It's good to have if, uh, feedback from folks who actually have experience with the subjects that we are pontificate on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this comes from Ron. Hi, FHB crew. I enjoyed your conversation in episode 443 about the future of home building. You welcome thoughts from listeners, so here we go. I believe the future of affordable high-performance home building is SCIP panels. With this system, the walls and roof are constructed with a panel con containing an EPS foam center and a thick wire mesh on both sides. Welded diagonals through the foam create a strong, lightweight truss system. Two inches of concrete are sprayed on the inside and outside walls, creating an I-beam type structure. The system has the following advantages. It's extremely resilient to wildfire, hurricane, earthquakes, and flooding. There's no wood, so rot, mold, and water damage problems are eliminated. Moisture barriers, siding, and sheetrock are eliminated with the use of concrete. Insulation and air tightness are inherent in the system. The thermal mass is insulated on the inside of the building. It has a very quiet interior. The EPS foam thicknesses can range from four to eight inches to cover different climates. It has ICC code approval. The lightweight panels are easy to transport over long distances, and there's no large equipment needed for construction. I'm in the planning phase of a 1,200 square foot wildfire rebit house. Not counting labor, the panels cost around $30,000. Concrete for the walls and roof is around $9,000. After the foundation, it should take three people under four weeks to stand the walls and roof, cut openings for windows and doors, and spray and smooth the concrete. We all know that ancient change is difficult for home building. Do you think this system will be used more in the future? Thanks, Ron. Here are a few links. Well, who wants to go first? Are we going to see this in the future? No. No? Why not, Ian? I think you will in, in, wire, in like wildfire areas, but the, the one thing that he's missing on that list is resilience to the changes that Andrew and I and you see in Connecticut in zones five, six, and seven on the humid end where you have uh, humid summers followed by extremely cold winters. Uh, I think that from watching the videos and just thinking about different building applications like this, uh, it's going to be incredibly hard to flash it for uh, areas where water can penetrate into that assembly and then freeze hmm. and start to blow the concrete apart. Interesting. Uh, I'm also not totally sold that uh, people are going to want that concrete finish on the inside because uh, once you do that, how do you do any uh, electrical or other mechanicals in your exterior wall? Uh, so I see the, the limiting factor on the mechanical end being uh, pretty difficult for areas where you have to condition the house in, in two separate ways. Really cool for wildfire areas and uh, your southeast dry uh, hot climate. Southwest, I think you mean. Sorry, yeah, southwest, <laughs> but not, not southeast with the, the hot humid. Yeah. Jeff, Andrew, any thoughts? I mean, I'd like to think we're still centuries away from having to live in concrete bunkers, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the other thing I think about is for a building to sort of stand the test of time, it's like resilience in the short term, but the ability to be repaired and repurposed in the long term, 
Um, and anytime you get, you know, foam sheathed in anything, um, it gets gets tricky. Jeff, you got thoughts? Uh, just a lot, a lot of uh, co- um, carbon built into that system. Yeah, too. I was thinking embodied energy and carbon is not where this is going. I'd also question the the cost in it um, at thirty thousand for uh, the wall panels for a twelve hundred square foot house, and then adding concrete and adding labor into it. Uh, he's going to be over what I built my. Uh, similarly sized uh, wood ground house. floor footprint yeah. uh, wood framed house for plus to Andrew's point the uh, the rebuild uh, work on factor uh, it's way more challenging right you know and, yeah. and my understanding and I don't know a lot about it is like sprayed concrete is a very specialized sub trade and it can be very difficult to find people in certain parts of the country where that is a thing um, yeah. Right. This I mean, did lead, this question did lead me to think about something else that I'd like to throw out to the listeners as a, a scavenger hunt, as I haven't been able to find any data on this yet. <laughs> uh, would be population data per IECC climate zone. So, you know, how many people actually live in climate zone six? How many people live in climate zone five? And I think that would start to uh, drive where the changes in home building need to be. Because if you're coming up with all of these systems that work great in, you know, a climate zone two or three and on the dry end, uh, they don't, they may not pertain to large portions of U.S. population. It is so coincidental you would bring that up, Ian, because I was turned on to a YouTube presenter who I really found interesting, and his title is or handle is Geography King, and he uses maps to uh, show comparisons of things. Um, And one of the things he showed that was super interesting to me yesterday was population density in respective states. And, of course, different states have you know, overwhelming differences in population density. But even within those states, uh, the the difference between rural and urban areas is very stark. And uh, I think it would be a good way to determine what you are curious about, because you could actually see county by county where folks live in the respective climate zones, and you could probably figure it out. But yeah, um, the closest thing I found was uh, some data that someone had put together showing the amount of population whose climate zone changed when the IECC redid their zones. Like we're, where I'm at, we're now, I think, zone 5B or something like it that. It got warmer, I can guess. It got warmer, yeah. yeah. So when the, the Wisconsin had the highest percentage of population that changed climate zones in the U.S., which I was pretty surprised by because we were all in zone six and now the bulk of the state population in the southern half is in zone zone 5B or something like that. Can I guess Uh, you boosted your mini split uh, cooling capacity by a half a ton or whatever to account for that climate (laughs) zone change? (laughs) Not not me, but it was still interesting though. the, the, The population data from one area to another, I think, can help drive where innovation needs to be in the home building industry. Well, it, like it helps prioritize it maybe yeah. a little bit because it is it's such a huge problem and ev- like solutions are different based on your climate. Right. Um, yeah. I'm yeah, going to say climate than... zone four somewhat arbitrarily because it's in the <laughs> middle. And if you look at the map, it's it hits a huge chunk of population. You guys are just let me stand on that. Great, I'll just like move on. <laughs> I, I was um, going to guess five because I think I think five. that Chicago and New York City and Detroit and a lot of the Rust Belt uh, metro areas are in five, and I think that Ohio is totally in five. Maybe the southern part of it might be in four, uh, but that's that's a pretty significant chunk of population uh, in in climate zone five. I'll get our analytics person on it for you. Yeah, (laughs) cool. I'm sure there's got to be somebody that's into that that listens to this and maybe has some data. 
Uh, Nick had further thoughts on my uh, water heater dilemma. Patrick, I wanted to take a moment to share my water, repla my water heater replacement experience with you and the team. My home had an electric water heater when we moved in, and last March it started leaking from the base. It's not a surprise as we have hard wall water and there isn't a filtering system set up before we took ownership. When looking for a replacement unit, I made sure to do as much research as I could looking at the current electric and heat pump units. A new electric water heater, according to the Energy Guide label, stated a cost of over $400 a year for energy, the same as the unit, unit I would be replacing. A heat pump water heater stated a cost around $100 a year. I'm always skeptical of these labels, but at a difference of $300 a year, I was intrigued. The cost difference between the electric and heat pump model at the time of purchase was about $1,100, no small amount. But after doing a cost analysis, I realized it would take me a little over three and a half years to break even, and from that point on, I would be saving $300 a year. Even if the energy savings were only half the stated amount, I would still break even before the warranty on the new heat pump water heater was expired. I went with a heat pump unit, and a year later, I'm glad I did. I have a family of five, three kids between 7 and 11, so the water heater gets put, through, gets put through its paces. After that first year, the energy usage was almost dead on. The unit has a panel that connects to my home, to my phone for monitoring and stats, so I was able to verify that my usage was within 61 kilowatt hours of the energy label, that is 61 kilowatt hours less than the estimated usage. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Some additional notes. I was very intrigued by the Marathon water heater, as were you, due to the amount of insulation, but with the energy usage cost was the same as a standard electric unit, and with my family, it wasn't likely that the water would be in storage for too long. That unit was also installed in my unfinished basement where I also have a dehumidifier, so that was a plus. I initially was concerned about how the unit would do in the winter as the basement is only passively heated by a wood furnace, but I didn't have any issues with it working in a cooler environment. Best of luck to you and your water heater adventure, venture, Nick. Well, thanks, Nick. I, I love hearing uh, real world uh, experience, you know, in, in our lives, we get so many people telling us things are great and oftentimes they are great, sometimes they're not, but it's hard to argue with folks who have uh, firsthand experience with something. Well, it's been an action-packed episode already. Should we get to a question? Absolutely. Uh, oh, wait, uh, this we comes... haven't done a question yet. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from Jim. I saw this in the Wall Street Journal and can't figure out what is with the blue stuff. Is it a preservative for rotten case of flooding, termite proofing? It looks like it was pulling on after the framing was up. So what product? So what protects the bottom end of the studs? If it's for flooding, why build there? And that comes from Jim. What, uh, I think what Jim is talking about is this blue stuff, which is sprayed on the bottom of the exterior walls in this structure, shown in this uh, Wall Street Journal story he sent us. And uh, as is the custom with the Wall Street Journal, it doesn't really show me anything because it <laughs> I don't subscribe, but I got the gist of it. Did you guys see the picture? I did. Yeah. What do you think it is? Some kind of treatment for bugs or rot of, yeah. of some type. Yeah. Did you see this, Jeff? No. We should tell folks that I didn't invite Jeff to the party today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Jeff first was a late edition. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. We were all uh, waiting for the producer to let us know when uh, to show <laughs> up and, and just never came. Thanks for coming, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so for I'm inviting me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is dye uh, for a termiticide. Termiticide. Um, or a borate treatment, um, they, they add this to the, the chemicals so you can tell if it's been done adequately, right? So Because somebody's clearly paying to have this house treated for my guess is because it's in the deep south or in the uh, California where there are lots of termites. And some of the restoration work that I've done, we would mix our own borate treatment with some kind of powder that you could order and mix it with water and spray it on with uh, just a regular pump hand sprayer. But the idea to dye it never, um, never came to us, but that would have made it a lot easier to show the boss, that, like, hey, we actually did it. Uh, and the client, of, right? The yeah. client can point to the blue stuff and be like, look at a good job they did. Yep. 
Was this the article about um, larger corporations starting to like build houses for their workers? So there, there was a. I, <laughs> oh, yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah I think that so was there, the, the context. Of it it. Was, I told you I, it wouldn't let me see it. Yeah, it was like a <laughs> Texas-based company that was like, "How do we help our our employees? You know, take that first step into home ownership." And I think they had actually like started a construction subdivision in their company to build affordable housing for their employees. Awesome. That's all I can say. Awesome. Yeah. Andrew yeah. probably came upon the article while researching some investment opportunities uh, yes. in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Put a pin in it for the podcast. Well, I saw the headline in the Wall Street Journal, and then I tried to find <laughs> another news organization who had written about it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, as far as building in termite or in uh, flood-prone areas, uh, there was another story in the New York Times about how that's a big problem still. And uh, our na nation's flood insurance program is, uh, you know, underwater, ironically. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the premiums are not what they should be because it would probably be unaffordable for most folks who are, you know, single-family homeowners. There's a lot of lake and river uh, areas in Wisconsin where they will not let you rebuild uh, once your your house is condemned because of a, a flood. Uh, it's pretty pretty common here. My guess is those are folks who probably have the least flexibility with moving and uh, changing yeah. their situation. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like somebody's third or fourth home that's right. going to get condemned. <laughs> uh, this comes from Will in Texas. Hey, podcast team, big fan of the show. I wrote in not too long ago, and your response was so very helpful, I figured I would do it again. I live in a 1959 ranch style down in Fort Worth, Texas. The house was originally built without any soffit, so the rafters have been exposed since the house was built. There have been many attempts to paint them over the years, but none seem to be very good attempts. I imagine that's because it is so labor-intensive slash time-consuming to paint three sides of a rafter and all of the decking that is exposed between each one of them. Anywho, I have decided to shoot from the hip and just go for a solution that seemed all right to me. Last summer, I started adding my own take on a soffit job. I bought a table saw and a compound miter saw and started nailing up quarter-inch plywood. I painted it with some paint and tried to do a very good about caulking the edges. It has done pretty well over the last year. Before I admit to my first embarrassing mistake, I will say I only got about 10 to 12 feet done near my back porch. My mistake is I didn't vent it at all. Well, I assume this is a mistake since the house was built in 1959 without the intention of ever having soffit, the attic has been pretty well sealed. So here are my questions. One, do I need to vent? If so, how often? I have seen little round vents on Amazon in 40 packs. This seems like quite a lot, so am I, just, I am just not sure how many feet I need between each one of these little vents. Does it matter that the things are pretty much sealed between the inch rafter since the house was never designed to have soffit venting? Is quarter inch plywood the correct approach? I really appreciate y'all's help and I look forward to your insightful response. Much obliged, Will in Texas. Anyone? What do you think, Patrick? I think this is the perfect solution. Why not? Just cover up the exposed rafter tails if you don't want to paint them and I totally get why you wouldn't. And as far as venting them, why worry about it? It was never vented assembly in the first place. The, the you know, rafter ends were blocked off because otherwise critters would have went right into the attic. What do you guys think? I completely agree. Yeah. Andrew? I, I was going to say uh, painting three sides and in between seems like a great job for a paint sprayer. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I've always wanted to use, learn to use one, you know, like one of the masters. So that that may have been what I had, I had done before buying a table saw and a compound miter saw. But it seems like a good solution. I'm going to just offer a little feedback on your solution. Uh, I say any project that offers the EU opportunity to buy a new tool or two is a good thing to do. <laughs> I would much rather buy... Better. I would buy a table saw and a miter saw way before I ever bought a paint sprayer. That's just me. Yeah. Any project that can be used as a Trojan horse for tool purchase is a project <laughs> worth, worth at least starting. Don't have to yeah. finish it. Definitely start, start the project. 
start Jeff? it and then abandon it, but buy the tools. Yeah. Jeff, what do you think about this approach? Yeah, no, I think that's definitely the way to go is to just cl close in that soffit. Oh my God, it's unanimous. It never happens. <laughs> Will, I think you can have confidence that you are doing the right thing. And don't until be afraid we, to buy Until we hear from a dozen people that says we're all crazy. <laughs> Ryan writes, good evening. Our home just turned six years old and we are located in zone two, Houston, Texas with year round humidity. As energy costs are constantly increasing, we're considering installing a whole house dehumidifier to save on our energy bills, lengthen the lifespan of our air conditioner and limit the opportunity for mold slash mildew to thrive. We have a one and a half story house with a dedicated one and a half ton, 14 seer air conditioner for the upstairs 400 square feet playroom, excuse me, 400 square playroom and another three and a half ton, 14 seer unit for the downstairs, which is 2,800 square feet and includes three bedrooms. We considered spray foam in the attic at one point, but the furnace needs an air source and we had concerns about a backdraft. So our plan is to straighten out the slack and kinked out air conditioning ducts and add a whole home dehumidifier such as the April Air 100. Is a whole house dehumidifier the solution to our energy and comfort problems or are we missing a more obvious step? I browsed some BSTAT IO data. Do you guys know what this is? What is BSTAT IO data? No idea, but it was a pretty cool graph. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to talk about that here in a sec. In the summertime, our indoor humidity is in the high 50s, low 60s, and the annual average is 48.5. I was un unable to download the entire year history, but did get the last seven day snapshot. Thank you for your insight, Ryan. Okay, so what's what's the, the the graph show, Ian? So the the graph shows the different ranges of humidity inside, outside, uh, throughout the day. I'm trying to pull up the graph here, but I was pretty impressed by it. It had a lot of a lot of good information on it. Could you make a spreadsheet from it? Is my question. You can make a spreadsheet from anything. <laughs> if, you if you haven't learned that since I joined the show, where have you been? Whether or not it's worth the time, that's that's the question. I think we can track his air conditioning runtime if you look at that graph, right? You, yeah. I think the spikes are when it, it's about to come on, and then you can see it gradually taper off until it's ready to come on again. Yeah, so it has indoor temp, outdoor temp, cool set point, indoor humidity, outdoor humidity. And then temperature on the left side and uh, percent humidity on the right side, along with the times of the day. We did this story, right, Andrew, on a whole house standalone dehumidification uh, very recently in fine home building. Uh, and uh, I will put a link to that in the podcast page. For people like Ryan and these very hot, humid places, this is the perfect solution for uh, interior comfort and protecting your house from mold because much of the year your air conditioner is uh, oversized because it's meant to deal with super hot um, and the rest of the year, it's going to have short run times, which are going to be a problem for uh, controlling humidity. So I think it's a great idea. And straightening out your kinky flex duct is a it's, very good start. It's an even better idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do that. It, no matter what you do, do that. That's such an easy DIY. Anybody can do it. Uh, activity, too, is replacing or straightening out some of that that duct that inevitably just gets thrown into an attic space. If, if I were going to do this in your climate, Ryan, I would do it very early in the morning or wait till winter, <laughs> though, because uh, it can be very dangerous in attics in the summertime, even in relatively mild climates, right? Yeah, without any moving air, you can get overcome by that heat very fast. Yeah, it's dangerous. It's, you know, one of the uh, things that comes to my uh, fine home building inbox is uh, uh, OSHA tales, right? Uh, OSHA quick takes, they call it. And, you know, every summer folks die in, air, in attics working on air conditioning systems or duct work. You know, it's, uh, I think it's most often electricians and HVAC techs who get up there and uh, get in serious trouble. At least take your phone up there. Oh my goodness, that's, that's a must. 
or one of those like sharper image things that you put around your neck and it's like a personal uh, cooling <laughs> system like you, you know get at the airport at some weird little kiosk I would totally, uh, you know, make fun of that, but it's probably a good idea in that situation, <laughs> right? Oh my goodness, we have we have another question to go and, and, and limited time. Here we go. So this comes from Jonathan, our friend from Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, greetings. A few years ago, my local civic association tried to start a tool library where members could borrow power tools for free. Unlike a big box store, it would be hyper local and free, and maybe even come with some help. The thinking was that many homeowners don't want to invest the money in a tool they may only need once or twice. We pulled the membership and came up with a list of most wanted tools. It included some basic stuff and heavier duty tools like a hammer drill, chainsaw, and stump grinder. That's the best one. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I was already planning which pesky stump to remove first when the issue of insurance came up. No company was willing to insure the Civic Association Board for Liability. We were told that waivers don't stop people from suing and may stop them from winning. Insurance companies still have to spend money to defend these cases. We tried going through an insurance broker. It didn't go so well. He was aghast we would consider loaning dangerous tools to strangers. <laughs> the whole idea quickly fell apart. Meanwhile, the stumps remain. Our civic association is not an HOA. Membership is optional, and we can't tell anybody what their mailboxes should look like. It's best that way. P.S. Tool Tribe doesn't have a presence here, last I checked. Jonathan, Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, what a fantastic idea. What do you guys think? It's a great idea, but I think he's got a campaign for tort reform on the local level <laughs> before he gets into it, which that's probably a taller order than renting a stump grinder to your neighbor. I couldn't help but think that this, the, the, the workaround here is nobody owns the tools, nobody uh, controls the lending of the tools, right? If tools just ended up at a central location, you know, by accident, and people could go there and use them, I'm going to get sued myself for suggesting this <laughs> idea, right? Well, I think the, the model that you're talking about is like the, the classic retirement home wood shop or, you know, vacation camping ground wood shop where it, they probably do get around it by, you know, the community owns the tools. Nobody, nobody actually owns them. I think stump grinder is probably a Maybe a step too far, but... But I got to be... I'm with Jonathan, though. If I wanted a tool that my... Like, I don't want to buy, that's one of them, I got to say. Mm -hmm. Right? That's... And... Can you, can you rent a stub grinder? Yeah. 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 You would, Isn't that amazing? I, I <laughs> yeah. Think the, I think the way to go with the stump grinder would just be to organize stump grinding day, and then somebody goes and rents it, and you have <laughs> that's a good idea. out there grinding stumps. But I think for power tools, what you said, Patrick, is a, is a good workaround. So in uh, the Twin Cities, we have the uh, Minnesota Tool Library, and like, there's one in Minneapolis, one in St. Paul. You pay, it's like 20 bucks a month, and you can check out a handful of tools at a time, and they do classes, but everything from like garden tools to portable table saw, miter saw, drills. Are you um, a member of this, Andrew? No, I actually, I run my own unofficial uh, chapter, so I'm just lending out tools all the time. Um, but the, it's like they didn't have any of the tools I wanted, like a stump grinder or those, those bigger domino. things. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think they do have a domino, wow. um, which is worth the, uh, worth the price of the mission. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's also like a great way to get people into tools and like a first time homeowner, you just bought the most expensive thing you're ever going to buy for 20 bucks. You can get all the tools you need to maintain it. I would be worried about like people destroying the stuff that's part of the library. Whose job is it to fix the things that come back with all their teeth missing or, you know, or the, the starter cord is ripped out of the stump grinder or whatever things can happen, right? Well, so they also host like a monthly fix it event for all the folks in the neighborhood like to tinker with stuff. You know, you can come and maintain tools. <laughs> I, I would love to know how they get around the insurance uh, aspect of this quandary. Well, they're, I think, they're functioning as like a 
a regular tool rental place, right? Just doing it on a membership basis. Yeah, and it I think it's a it, a, a nonprofit 501c3 thing. So maybe there's I don't know, maybe there are better insurance rates for nonprofits. What do you think about this, Jeff? Would you want to share tools with a lending library? I would love to have access to those things that I don't own, but I am a a tool collector, so. <laughs> What's on your list of things you would get from the the, the tool library if, if they had it? Probably stuff they wouldn't have, like, you know. A stump a, grinder? A front end loader. <laughs> Backhoe, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Twin post lift. <laughs> Do they come and install it in your mm-hmm. garage? <laughs> That's a good idea. Twin post lift, man. That would be awesome. It was in my garage. I've seen uh, like kind of portable ones set up at like drag racing events because, of course, folks who have dragsters like need a twin post lift at the track, right? And so somebody has one of these things set up on a on a trailer and they drag it around and you pay ten or fifteen bucks to use it when you need it. It's kind of cool, right? I should have put an oil change pit in my garage. That would have been Why really didn't cool. you? I don't know. I wasn't thinking. I didn't ask you about the garage. That was a major design error on my it's part. It's not too late, man. You, you know, at least cut the hole while you don't have before you put the drywall up because it's going to cut down on the spray. Re- redo all the pecs uh, that's running through the slab for heating it. I think you just need some couplings. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So this came over the transom, and I thought I would share it with you guys. Um, You might be surprised to learn that the New York Times had a story about occasionally um, the homes featured in cable television home improvement shows have some problems after they're completed, and some of the people who have worked with these production companies are unsatisfied with the quality of construction or some of the defects. So... Uh, The first thing I thought to do when I learned about this was to go in and tell Carol about it. And I was like, you might be surprised to learn that these, some of these homes have problems. And she's like, was this from the no Sherlock news feed? (laughs) 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 Did you guys read this story? I hope you did. I I did with glee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about it, Ian? Some people watch YouTube videos of like puppies and kittens to get uh, warm, fuzzy (laughs) feelings. I read articles like this about the failures of HGTV shows. Oh, man. What were your thoughts, Andrew? Uh, Well, it was curious that this article popped up at the same time uh, a PR rep from a similar show (laughs) reached out to be like, hey, like, there's a good story to tell if you want to tell it. Um, having so I've I did a little bit of work on a reality TV show that's not home improvement related, um, but even just like thinking about the constraints of a crew and budgets and timelines, and then like having to actually build something build a house. physical, and not <laughs> yes. just not just a story, right. but like an actual structure. Um, it's. It makes a lot of sense why there are issues and they're coming to light. And I don't know, I don't know, like if there's a way around it other than you know, like the originator, of this old house, like does one or two houses in a year. You know, like that's how long these projects take. And I would maintain that this old house is different because the projects are, of course, influenced by the production of the TV show. But mm-hmm. the builder still decides how the house is built and the order of things and what gets, uh, you know, blown up. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not drama. It's building. There's enough drama yeah. in building to make a TV show. I mean, building something's already exciting enough. Why do we no have kidding. to dress it up? <laughs> so Did my you read my the- wife is going to hate that I bring this up here, but she was interviewed to be on Top Chef back in the day and at the height of her uh, chef career in New York. And I think what what killed her chances was when the producer asked her what her biggest concern was about going on the show. And she said, finding out that it's not about food. (laughs) (laughs) And I, I would think that that would be my biggest concern as a homeowner would be going on one of these shows and finding out that it's not about my home. 
I think the very best part of this New York Times piece, and I'll put it on the podcast page so folks can read it if they're interested, but the very closing remark was by one of the uh, disgruntled homeowners. And what he said was, they built a nice set to film their TV show. And I think if you keep the whole thing in that context, it was like, you know, a light bulb went off for me when I read that. Of course, that's what they're doing. They're making a set to make a TV show. They don't really are, they're less worried about you, let's say. The other thing that was revealed to me in this was that folks sign very strict confidentiality uh, contracts with regard to their participation in these things. And in some cases, they're not even supposed to talk to their friends and family about, you know, what has gone on behind the scenes, which that should be telling. <laughs> should tip someone, you off right there. Yeah, if someone yeah. asked me to sign this document before the thing even got underway, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. Can you imagine if we as contractors would you know, put that in our building contract. You can never talk <laughs> bad about us to your neighbors. Nobody would hire us. Once again, quite a surprise. Do you guys have anything before we go? No, no I think you ended strong after yeah. an odd start without a producer. <laughs> Jeff is never going to let me forget this. I know it. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Andrew, Ian, and Jeff for joining me, especially Jeff. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Sign those contracts. <laughs>